Science has a communication problem. It always has. But while we could mostly brush it under the rug in the past, we are currently faced with big global problems that need action immediately. One, of course, is COVID-19. I'm a science communicator. My job is to translate scientific information into something understandable and accessible. But even I was overwhelmed by the absolute fire hose of information coming from every direction. So I wanna talk about three things. Why our science communication doesn't always match up with our science education. How misinformation uses stories and our emotions to spread a narrative and how we can use the tactics of misinformation to spread science stories instead. First, our science education. When we learn about science in school, we learn about it as a series of facts. DNA has four nucleotide bases, plants turn CO2 into O2 through photosynthesis, and Pluto is a planet. Or is it? Many of us learned that Pluto was a planet in school, but then in 2006, the International Astronomical Union downgraded Pluto to a dwarf planet. There was, of course, an uproar, as many of us had loved the cold, small planet. But as scientists learned more about our solar system and the many objects in it, they changed definitions and statuses to be more reflective of the new knowledge that they had. And in doing this, to be as up to date as possible, they had to demote Pluto. But this is exactly how science works and how science should work. As we gain more information about our world, we update our definitions and knowledge and guidance. Science isn't just a static study of the world, but rather a process of asking questions, learning new things, and then asking more questions. And this can be a messy process. Experiments fail. Questions lead to answers you never expected. Groups disagree on methods and how to best run experiments, and all of this is good. It means that science is always evolving and moving and adapting. But it can take time to look at all of the results, sort through all of the pieces, and draw a clear conclusion. And usually, scientists communicate these updates at the end of the process. After the studies have been done and the data has been hashed out at conferences, papers have been reviewed, and time has passed. Typically, when I'm looking for a recent paper on a topic, I'm looking for something that's been published in the past five years. But in the middle of a global pandemic, scientists have had to communicate their findings in real time, messy data and all. When I look for an up-to-date paper to cite these days, I am absolutely looking for something from this year, or even better, this month. At the very beginning of the pandemic, not much was known about the science of COVID-19. Yet people understandably wanted answers and they wanted them quickly. So rather than having years to do careful, slow studies on a newly emerging pathogen and then look at all of the results together to form a full picture of the virus, data trickled out to the public as soon as it was collected. Often this was through preprints, scientific manuscripts that have not yet been reviewed by scientific peers. While these are important parts of the publishing process, they can be incomplete or missing evidence that other scientists would deem necessary to draw a conclusion. If each new study and new piece of data around COVID-19 was a puzzle piece, it was as if the public was getting information piece by piece, as if someone was randomly plucking them from a box rather than seeing the final assembled puzzle all at once. And so sometimes conclusions seemed to change. As we learned more about how the virus spread and that airborne transmission was far more important than surface transmission, advice from places like the WHO and the CDC changed from focusing on hand washing to mask wearing. But this wasn't because scientists were wrong about COVID at first. It's because as they learned more, they updated their recommendations. And scientists like to be careful about what they say. As we're collecting data, we use words like likely or possibly or may. This is because as we're still learning, we wanna make sure we're not overstating assumptions or drawing wrong conclusions. But again, the public is used to hearing definitive headlines like researchers find coffee protects against Alzheimer's or scientists find coffee increases risk of Alzheimer's. These are statements that are communicated like final answers even if they're clearly not the whole picture. And I experienced this disconnect between how scientists talk and how science is typically presented to the public firsthand this year. 
As I searched for information about the virus and about vaccines, I shared what I found publicly with the world through social media. And, like a scientist, I used words like likely that showed that the evidence was still evolving. But I got comments with sentiments like, when I learned science in school, it had answers. Or, you must not know what you're talking about if you're just saying might, is it or isn't it? What is seen by scientists as a responsible way to communicate is seen by the public as a lack of confidence or information. And at the same time that scientists were carefully trying to talk about uncertain data, a gigantic wave of misinformation arose, ready to provide broad statements and misinformation that sounded like answers and pulled on heartstrings. Because there wasn't one clear source of information during the pandemic, charlatans and fake medical experts popped up everywhere with their own theories and speculations, sometimes looking for notoriety and other times looking to sell a product. Misinformation is insidious because it is so often based on strong emotions like fear and anger. Rumors swirled that COVID-19 wasn't real, that it was just a way for the government to take away your rights. Instagram posts spread fear-filled lies that the vaccines were going to affect fertility. And while none of this was true, it was effective and it spread faster than the careful muted language that scientists were using. A 2018 study found that fake news traveled farther and faster than true news stories on Twitter, and that false stories inspired fear, disgust, and surprise in replies, while true stories inspired anticipation, sadness, joy, and trust. People are also much more likely to share stories that align with beliefs they already hold. This is confirmation bias. We assign more weight to evidence and information that agrees with something that we already believe than evidence that refutes it. And while this has been backed up by scientific data, it's also something you can capture yourself doing too. I know that I am much faster to retweet a news article based on a headline I agree with than stopping reading a headline I don't agree with and investigating the source. And so many of us are prone to doing this that Twitter even has a new pop-up now asking if you'd like to actually read the article before you retweet it. But what can we learn from that misinformation? I think what we need as scientists and communicators to take away from this is that emotions, stories, and narratives are compelling and that we can reach lots of people when we use them. And science has lots of good stories to tell, but as scientists, we're often taught to tell them dispassionately and to lay out only the facts. But I think there's a middle ground. I think we can structure those facts and tell those stories in a way that can empower people to feel supported by science rather than scared of it. Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, an amazing scientist and communicator, also recommends meeting people where they already are and tailoring messages to beliefs that they already hold. This does not mean lying. It means finding common ground and shared values and using that as a starting point for a conversation. And COVID-19 isn't the only thing we have to do this with. Climate change is just as pressing of an issue, and we need to learn to tell better, more compelling stories about it. For years, scientists have presented data about how dire it is, numbers about how many species we're losing, or the rate at which waters will rise, but that data needs to be centered around human narratives and around stories of people. It needs to focus on the effects that climate change will have, not on the planet, but on us. So what can we learn from over a year of communicating during a massive emergency? First, I think we need to be more transparent about the process of science, about what we know and what we're still learning. Second, we need to take a page out of misinformation's book and learn how to use stories to deliver facts and information. And finally, I think we need to be better as scientists about engaging with the public through both of those things from the moment a hypothesis is thought up to the final conclusion. And what I would ask of everyone watching, scientist or not, is to keep an eye out for misinformation whenever you share something, especially in high stress times when information is moving quickly. Remember that misinformation is trying to use your emotions to get you to click, like, or share. Watch out for your own confirmation bias. Analyze where information is coming from what real data it is presented, and whether or not the person sharing it could have another motive. Because the more that we can recognize information versus misinformation, the faster we can start to tackle the biggest problems facing us right now.